Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar we're going to be doing today about IT containment. My name is Paul Bemis. I'm the president of Applied Math Modeling, and we're going to spend the next 45 minutes going through how to properly or appropriately model IT containment in a data center. I try to pick these topics based on the kinds of models I'm seeing. I review here a lot of different models that we work on. And so this one is one that comes up a lot, and I'd like to just review for you how to do it, what to look for, what, what to do in terms of um, approach. Uh, but first of all, for those of you who don't know Applied Math Modeling, who we are, we were founded in 2008 as a spin out of the Ansys Corporation. We are uh, effectively a value-added partner for them. And we are responsible for all the development and sales and support of the Coulson product. Coulson is actually built on top of ANSYS. It uses the Fluent Solver for uh, ANSYS Fluent. So um, ANSYS acquired Fluent. So they use the Fluent Solver for meshing posts and solving. And as a result, we're able to put together a very, very cost-effective solution that is a SaaS model. It's a software as a service model. And uh, we do all the delivery support and we also do modeling services. Um, so that's a quick overview on us. Let me just uh, tell you in terms of a little housekeeping here today, if you want to ask questions, I'd like to make these sessions as interactive as I can. So uh, I have two displays up. On the second display, I have a, uh, the interface for the GoToMeeting session. And uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, there's one or two ways to do it. The easiest way to do it is to type it out as a question in the uh, go to webinar section. There's a little place right there where you can type in a question. I can also try to unmute your microphone if you want to. That often gets into a situation where um, the audio uh, causes problems on the feedback. So, so let's get into modeling IT racks specifically. There's a few things I wanted to show you here. And, uh, yep. So IT racks are made up, of course, of servers. And each one of the servers has its own proprietary thermal management system. And we don't know what they are. Um, this is a fundamental issue. Uh, each one of them is proprietary. They're owned by the company. And they're not willing to share them because it's, it's information that they view as a competitive advantage. The power consumption of the server is correlated to the speed of the airflow through the server. Uh, in other words, the higher the density of the machine, the more air you have to push through it in order to keep that thing cool. Uh, so it is a challenge to try to cool some of these that are particularly high density. Um, and the details of that relationship are governed by this equation. And the equation of, is, of course, that heat transfer Q is equal to the airflow rate uh, times the specific or times the density times the specific heat of air at, at altitude. This uh, number C sub P will change based on altitude times the difference between inlet and outlet temperature. So the inlet temperature is usually ambient. Uh, that's ambient air in the data center itself. Outlet temperature is the heat coming out of that rack. Um, the specific heat and density are related to atmosphere of course, and, and, and related to altitude, which is an adjustment you can make in the software, and that gives you your heat. And that's the same equation, by the way, that is governing the, the heat exchanger that's dumping the heat out of the room. So the air handler itself is governed by that same equation. Okay, and that's why the flow rates should be nearly equivalent between the two, and the delta Ts should be nearly equivalent between the servers and the air handler, uh, by the way. Now, I thought I'd also show you what's going on at the chip level, this illustration I found is a fairly good one. And uh, there's a lot going on at the chip level that is causing the delta Ts on these machines to go up over time. Um, they're dumping more heat. The density is higher in this power module. And so these are actually dumping more heat than they ever have before. Uh, this equation talks about the flow rate. This is for the, the this package itself, in particular the heat sink, because it takes into account two coefficients that are in this uh, convective heat transfer equation. Again, it's convective heat transfer, which is the dominant equation that we use uh, for doing this kind of work. It's, it's uh, dominant compared to conductive or radiant. And uh, here we have H, which is the, the coefficient of uh, heat transfer for the, the package itself, uh, which has a lot to do with the structure of the package and the material in the package and so forth. 
And then we have A is the surface area of the package. And you, the more surface area you have, the better heat transfer you have. The delta T here is we're talking about the heat sink temperature, T sub S, and the ambient temperature. So this is trying to dump heat as fast as it can into the atmosphere. And the delta Ts um, uh, are rising uh, for a variety of reasons. So if you take a look, and this is a plot out of the ASHRAE uh, IT design impact manual. And uh, if you take a look at that manual, you'll see that they're projecting uh, these flow rates to decline. They're declining over time uh, to the point where um, at this juncture, here we are 2018 roughly, uh, we're in this range. All right, now this range looks like if we look at CFM per kilowatt, we're running probably from 60 to say 80, 90 uh, CFM per kW. That's down. That's down a great deal from where we started over here when we started applied math modeling. We were assuming about 156 uh, CFM per kW. You can see we were right here at 2008. We're coming down. Now, the, the trick for you as a person who's trying to predict the consumption of airflow in the data center is picking this number. And uh, it will depend upon how old your equipment is. So newer equipment, in particular servers, are going to be running up in this range, uh, where the older equipment in the room is down in this range. And you have to come up with a number here that is satisfactory and appropriate. And now uh, you can do that um, uh, a couple of different ways in CoolSIM. So this is a representation of the editor for the rack or the server. They're the same in CoolSIM. And I just uh, made a screenshot of this and showed you how they worked. If you go down to a single uh, kilowatt and took, and I'm doing this, I'm sorry, in, 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 in American units, Fahrenheit, not centigrade. But if you take it to a kilowatt, uh, the default right today in CoolSim is 25. We just increased that at 4.6. So at version 4.6, we increased the expected temperature rise to 25. And that changes the flow rate to about 123. You see now, if we go back to our chart, that's a little conservative. You see we're, we're, we're closer to here. We're right up in this region. But the reason we did that is because we're not necessarily assuming that all of uh, the equipment in the rack is new or newer. So this is something you have to pay attention to. Um, is your expectation, by the way, this is expected temperature rise uh, that uh, we have for the equipment in the room. All right, and then over here, what I did is I just increased it to 35. This is a variable in CoolSim. You can change this anytime you like. You can change it at the server level. You can change it at the rack level. But it's important to pay attention to it. I'd, I'd also like to point out here that uh, it is correlated. As you can see, it's automatically correlated. So if I type in 25 here, I get 123. If I type in 35 over here, the flow rate per rack is 88 CFM. And again, if we go back and look, that's right in this range. So uh, setting your expectations on your servers or your racks to be in the range of 25 uh, to 35 is not a bad thing to do at this point in the, uh, in the market. Um, 30 is a fairly conservative number. 25 is a little more conservative. And the reason I say that is because it drives the demand of the flow rate up. And that puts more stress, of course, on your air handlers and your M plus one studies and everything else. Everyone is, everything is keyed off of these numbers. It's important to take a look at them, understand what your assumptions are uh, going in to, uh, to the modeling sequence. So somewhere between 25 and 35 is, is good. Um, I would recommend uh, 30, 25 or 30. 35 might be a little aggressive even though it's above, well, it's up in that ASHRAE range. But this is done by the manufacturers, remember. This was a group within ASHRAE on TC99 who represent the equipment manufacturers. And so for new gear, this is where we are. For older gear, it's over here. So you have to understand, is it a brand new data center you're working on that has yet to be built? That's therefore over here. Is it a data center that exists and it may have a mix of equipment in it? If so, then it's a little further to the left. Okay, so that's just something I wanted you to be aware of and how it works. 
Um, and I did a small run here just to show you the comparative output. So now I'm looking at output. This was a very small case. It only had about 60,000 cells in it. So we have to remember that the resolution here is fairly coarse. But I uh, set a model up and did a run on it. I did a run a delta T of 30, expecting a 25 degree temperature rise is how I set it. And uh, the kilowatt here was four. And you see here the flow rate is a 412. So we're looking at about 100 CFM uh, per kW. Uh, assuming a delta T of 30, that was what I, uh, well, the delta T output is 30. Uh, the assumption on the input was 25. So you see that, that still feels pretty good. I would, I would tend to err towards a 25 degree delta on that input panel. If I move it up to 35, um, again, it comes in at about 88. This is a little closer to the uh, expected versus output, um, but, um, Again, it's just a little less conservative. You're using a little less air and you're making a little more assumption about that equipment being able to handle the uh, higher delta Ts. So again, I'd recommend uh, to use 25 in a conservative case, uh, move it up to 30 if you wanna be a little more aggressive. Uh, 35 would be the upper end that I would use for an input parameter on that, okay? Again, if you have any questions about this, just keystroke them into your question block uh, on your GoToWebinar panel uh, or put your hand up and I'll try to answer them as I go. Uh, this session is here for you today and uh, I want to make sure that you all can uh, understand what I'm trying to say here and, uh, and understand it. So now let's take a look at a typical design. And this is a design I've used before. I like it. I see a lot of these. Um, this assumes there's some air handlers on the roof or outside the room and they're blowing air down through a duct into a plenum wall and then distributing it across. This is a non-raised floor design. It is a hot aisle contained design. The ceiling is the plenum return in this case and therefore the room is the cold aisle. When you stand in the room, you're standing in the cold aisle. I tend to like these designs because you can drive your air supply temperature up to be uh, warmer and not uh, uh, discourage your visitors of the room. As you know, uh, you bring people into a room that's cold aisle contained, they get all nervous because it's hot. Uh, so hot aisle contained at least gets the hot contained into a section and out of the room, the room becomes the cold aisle. You can begin to move the temperature up and it won't affect the occupants. Uh, of the room that much. So here uh, in the pre-simulation report, uh, Coulson has a nice pre-simulation report that uh, sits right up here at the top. When you press that button, you get a report that tells you a summary of the uh, ratio of the air flows in the room. In this case, uh, this particular room has a delivery of 440,000 uh, CFM in total, and the demand by those racks is 380 because the delta T was set at a certain parameter, uh, probably 25 in this case, and therefore the, uh, the delta T, uh, the flow rate is 330,000. Uh, now that's max, that's absolute max, that's what it can do, and it's always greater uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, you want at least an N plus one design, so if you lose an air handler, um, then you can still operate, and uh, it's important to know uh, how the how the airflow occurs under the case where you've got one down. We call that N plus one studies or crack parameter variation. Uh, the other reason is that you want a positive pressure on the cold side pushing the air through the servers onto the hot side. So you want to always over deliver by a little. You want to at least over deliver by the amount of a single cooling unit and then typically you want to over deliver by even a little more than that to maintain a positive pressure. Okay, so that's uh, just a summary of this particular design. Now, modeling IT racks, um, what we do here, the first method is to use the baffle tool in CoolSim to, to create the enclosure. Now, the reason we do this is because the baffle tool allows air to pass through it. It uses a percentage leakage parameter which um, you know, is a long story in and of itself about percentages, uh, but effectively here, the baffle in CoolSim is a porous media. It's what we call a porous media object. Porous media, you can think of it as a screen, and the percent open area is the amount of uh, openness compared to 
uh, the solid in the screen itself. And just like a screen, um, the more delta P pressure across it, the more air is going to flow. So these are sensitive to pressure variation and uh, setting a percentage at five doesn't guarantee a, a quantity. It just guarantees an impedance, a resistance to airflow. Uh, in this case, it has uh, quite a bit of resistance because the area open is only 5%. Um, but oftentimes, uh, people will say to you, I want to assume a certain amount of leakage. And that's where these percentages start to become a little challenging because a designer will sometimes say, I've seen them say, well, let's assume that 10, we have 10% leakage in the containment. Uh, this means air supply has to be 110% of rack demand at all times. Uh, but the question of where is the leakage uh, pops up a lot. Um, you know, is the leakage in the rack? Is the leakage in the walls of the containment? Is the leakage at the end underneath? Where is the leakage? Because that's an important component in trying to determine whether or not the racks are all evenly uh, cooled. You need to think about where that leakage is. Uh, the first method that uh, is used oftentimes in CoolSim to produce this uh, rack containment is to use baffles on all four sides and then adjust the leakage to match the expectations of where the leakage will occur. Now, there's often some mistakes here made that I want to just point out. Again, if you set the baffles to 10% leakage, it doesn't mean that you're going to have 10% uh, more air go through them. It depends on the pressure difference across the baffle. It depends on the surface area of the baffle. Uh, so you have to uh, try to decide where you want that leakage to occur and adjust these percentages on these individual sides of the containment to match your expectations. You have to think about this. Typically, racks will link or leak at the intersection of the rack and the containment itself. Uh, racks also typically leak within the rack itself. For example, uh, if there's no blanking panels in place or the rack rails that are on the edges on either side, uh, they often leak on the top and on the bottom. So leakage in containment is often related to the intersection of the rack and the, the uh, containment uh, entity itself. Uh, or on the edges of where the rack containment come together, the perpendicular edges. So uh, this is really quite easy to do in CoolSim. It's very quick. And what I wanted to show you here is this, if we go back to this model again, and we take a look at it, um, you see here the way that we've set this one up is that on the end caps, we've set them for no leakage because end caps don't generally leak. Uh, they're generally made out of solid material, and they don't generally leak. Um, but uh, the sides do leak a little bit. So here we're going to give it a 5% open area on the sides. Now, we don't know what that's going to do for output. We don't know what the output's going to look like yet. All we're doing is setting input parameters, and until we make a run, we're not going to know. In this particular model, we're using rack rows. Uh, CoolSim has a very nice rack row feature that allows you to set these models up very quickly because the, the uh, rack is essentially one and you set its parameters and then you increment quantity and it just makes a whole row of them. Uh, so that's fast, but it does assume there's no leakage between these racks at all. They're solid, um, which is a fair assumption if you've built them so there is no leakage. Um, but again, you have to make some assumptions about it here. And, and this is the first set of assumptions we'll make. So I've created a small uh, screencast uh, video here to show you how this works. And I'm going to try to get this to work because it's just faster than me trying to do it as a GUI uh, in, the, in the machine itself or in the modeler itself. So here I'm showing you how to build these. I wanted to just show you how to build it because it's quick. So I just dragged a baffle into the room from the GUI up on top. And I'm going to, uh, you can rename it if you want, um, so that you know which are the end caps and, and which are the sides. This is, this is a user preference. You don't have to do this. But sometimes I do it just so that I can identify what's going on a little more easily. And then, uh, and then I, uh, I uh, go ahead and set the parameters of size. In this case, I'm going to set it to be five uh, feet wide. 
Now, I always make my containment a little bigger than necessary because uh, one of the nice things about CoolSim is you can have the baffle slice right through the rack and it will work. And that just saves you a lot of room, a lot of time. I'm going to set here the leakage to be zero. I don't want any on the end caps, but I have that positioned kind of nicely right there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another one. I just uh, control C, control V and bring it uh, down to the other side and put it in place wherever I want it. Again, I like it to overlap by a little because that is both realistic and, uh, and helps to, uh, to keep things from breaking in terms of simulation. So now I'm going to align them. Coolsum has a very nice tool for aligning. You just right mouse click it after you've uh, selected them both and you can align the edges. So I align them both uh, up so they're vertically uh, showing. And this particular uh, baffle, this is going to go on the side. I'm just changing the axis here so it goes up and down instead of across. I want to uh, drag that baffle over. I got to grab it and drag it over to, uh, to be close to the other one. You can line these up again with uh, these tools we have aligned. So here I'm going to select both of them. I'm going to put my cursor over the one I want to hold still. And then I say, in this case, either align it to an axis or close the gap. And that edge should look like a 45 degree angle, just like that when they're properly aligned. Remember this baffle is slicing right through the racks and to the floor. It is called in the room, which means it goes from the floor right straight up through to the ceiling, but not through the ceiling plenum, just up to the ceiling. So it's in room. I need to change the Z parameter uh, to get the length correct. Um, so the way to do that is to just uh, go to the geometry tab. Use I use endpoints sometimes to do this because I know where that other baffle is. I just worked on that a moment ago. I know it's at 66.1. So there's my uh, baffle right there. And now that uh, slices through the racks and all the way down, and I can now clone that. There's a clone tool in CoolSim that you'll see me use a couple of times. It's very handy. It allows you to clone individual objects like I'm doing here, uh, or you can clone entire structures. Once you group them, you can clone a structure. So I'm going to clone this, and now I have two of them. I see they're not lined up uh, quite right. There's some gaps there, so I'm going to again use my close uh, gaps tool here to close gaps in this case in X and then I'm going to close these as well in, in X and then I'm going to align them in Z if necessary. You can tell by looking if they need to be aligned. They look like they do. So I'm just going to align them. This is I'm going to align uh, or close gaps in Z. Yep. So just line these up using either close gaps or align. Either one will work. And then you just scoot down to the other end and uh, do the same procedure here. That one looks good. So now I have an enclosure. If we look at it in 3D, you see that enclosure comes all the way to the top. The end caps are, are not leaking. The sides are leaking at 5%. Now I can clone this. First, I group it. I highlight the whole section. I don't want the grill, so I just want the baffles. And I can now select it. The offset here in this particular design, the great thing about, uh, about uh, data centers is there's lots of symmetry. So I can grab that group and clone it. My offset is 18 feet in this particular design. So I just say I need seven of them. And I want them to be offset at 18 feet. And, uh, and I hit go or apply. And it lays them all in there for me, which just saves a lot of time. So now I have a contained environment. And I did it fairly quickly. Nice thing about uh, CoolSim is that clone tool that allows you to clone not just an individual object, but of course a whole group if you want. So that, that works pretty well. And uh, I also want to point out that you need to make your containment big enough so that those outlets stick through the baffle uh, with a little bit of room because the mesh will move them around a little bit to optimize mesh. And you want to make sure that they poke through enough to, uh, to be able to sustain a uh, a meshing activity or a meshing uh, movement to, uh, to for alignment. The mesher will move things around a little bit in the background, and if you don't have enough gap there, it may cause issues. So I wanted to show you that little video clip to show you how it was done. And now we'll go back to the slides here. Um, the objective, if you remember, was containment at 10%, uh, 110% of flow, so 10% leakage. Uh, 
And we did it using that last method. Now, uh, there's another method you could use to get it a little tighter. Uh, this method is to size the racks smaller than they'd be normally, and leave a small gap between them and under them and over them. Uh, use in this case, I use 10% between the racks and every and the blocks, and and the results might be a little more realistic. This is a, a just another method. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Same as before, but what we did is up in this section, I put a block. Now you could use a baffle here too at zero leakage. I just happen to use a block. A block is this rectangular block. You bring it down, you put it in, and uh, uh, it doesn't leak at all by definition because it's a block. Uh, and down here at the lower side, I still have a baffle like before, set in this case at 10% leakage. But the racks are a little smaller than normal uh, by two inches on a side. So I've got a gap underneath them. I guess I put four uh, underneath them. Yeah, I did. It's two on a side. So there's four between. I got two inch gap underneath, two inch gap on the top, and four inches between. Now what I'm modeling here is the actual leakage of the rails on a rack. And that's usually what leaks, is it leaks around those rails uh, in the rack itself, or underneath is a very popular place for leakage as well. This representation is, uh, is not hard to build either. It's fairly quick, again, using cloning, for example. The racks are now individual racks, and so there might be a little more time uh, necessary to click them and set their parameters. The rack row is faster with respect to parameter set. Uh, but this one might be a little more realistic um, if you want to get into this level of detail. This will, of course, drive the mesh count up as well. So with increased complexity uh, and increased detail, you do get a higher mesh count and therefore a longer runtime. But again, it's your choice. And in effect, the level of detail in CoolSim is as fine as you want it to be. This is a little different than accuracy. This gets confused a lot, the difference between accuracy and level of detail. Level of detail is how much detail do you expose in the model. Accuracy has to do with the numerics itself. We use the ANSYS solver and measure, and it's been proven over roughly 20 years, so the accuracy is very high. The issue becomes how much detail do you put into the model. So again, I have a small clip here just to show you. I wanted to show you how this one is done as well. I'm gonna run that. I'm hoping these work inside GoToMeeting. Sometimes there's a little bit of delay here, but I'm hoping these work okay for you. And uh, let's just see if this one's working at all. Yep, it is. Okay, so here, what I did in this case is I deleted everything in the, in the, in the room. All the other racks, I just highlighted them all, hit the delete key and deleted them. Uh, so now I go to this baffle. I'm just modifying the design and showing you how to do this. So here I want to put this now as general. I don't want it to go from ceiling all the way up. I, I want the, uh, the leakage to be 10% because this is going to be down at the rack level. And I just set the height on it to be uh, the seven foot rack that is very typical. So I put it to be seven feet. That's my leakage uh, baffle. Now, uh, and I do the same thing to the other side. You can either clone it, which is easy to do, or you can just uh, go ahead and edit it. In this case, it's just as easy to edit it because I know what the parameters are. I just did them. So I set it at 10%, and then I go over here to the uh, geometry itself, and I set the height for 7 feet. Um, so there you have it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this rack row, and I'm going to take the quantity uh, first of all, down to one, because I'm going to, right now it's at 2024. 20, it's important to remember how many racks I have in the row, because you, <laughs> you want the rack rows to come out the same as they did. But down here under size, I'm going to undersize it by just a little bit. I'm going to switch this to inches, and I'm going to make this uh, 20 inches wide. So I have two inch gap on either side. And then on this one, I'm going to go 80, because I want a two inch gap on top and bottom as well. And then I'm going to set this thing up off the floor just a little bit. Uh, remember, you, this is the minimum level you're going to mesh. So I set it at two inches. That's We're going to do a two-inch resolution in a 10,000-square-foot data center. Um, so that's a little challenging, but but Coolson pulls it off pretty well. I need 23 of these things. I use my clone button. I'm going to offset them uh, by, in this case, 
um, 24 inches, just like before, because that's the rack size. And I hit the apply button and it lays them all in. Boom, all done. So I've just done 24 racks and I did it quick. Again, the nice thing about Google Sim is that it has these features that just make it fast to lay these things out. So now I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. I could either clone the one before and uh, move it over and uh, replicate it and change the direction of airflow, or I can just uh, do what I did. So it's pretty easy to do what I did. I know what the parameters are. So I go down to one, and then I set this guy for 20, and then I set this guy for 80, and so forth. So uh, just set the parameters up to be the same. And uh, and then again, I want to get it up off the floor two inches. So and now I want to clone it. Same thing as before, clone. And uh, in this case, I'm going to clone it 23 times because I already have one. I want the offset to be 24 inches. And I hit the apply button. And uh, you do have to wait a second until the buffer gets full because it does make those copies. And then you hit apply and boom. So there we have it. So now this is a little more detail. Final thing I need to do is put in a, a block. Blocks come in as, rec as uh, columns. So you just need to change it from a column to something general. And then, of course, you need to set its height. In this case, um, I'm not exactly sure what the height's going to be. So first I set it to inches because I'm going to want to set it in inches. And then to remember what the height is, I know the rack baffle was, was seven feet, but I can't quite remember what the room is. So I just click on the room, find out that the room is uh, 13 feet. So I need a difference between 156 and, and uh, 7, which is 86. So I just set the height uh, to be that difference and, and plug it in here. I need to also adjust the start Y value so it starts at the right location. Um, so it's 76 inches of height, and I'm going to want to set this, uh, of course, at, uh, at 84. Whoops, I set it at 80. A little low actually but uh, this is a video and I can't fix that so <laughs> so there you go <laughs> and I want the width of it to be three inches okay so now I just need to get that into place I switch it to top view by the way if I had my other screen if you could see two screens at once you could put this in three one window in 3d and the other in 2d and you wouldn't have to keep flipping but I'm uh, just showing you this on one display so i'm switching uh, from uh, perspective to top view etc i take these two um, i do a close gaps in x in this case boom brings them in i want to also do a line to um, z min in this case brings it to the top by the way the center of the baffle is right in the visual middle a baffle has a zero thickness so what you see there is a, is a visual representation of a baffle and now I need to know the length of this thing. So I just click on the baffle and say, how long was that thing again? I click on use size and it tells me the length, 49.25. Uh, so I just double click on my, on my little uh, uh, rectangular block and I set the Z value to be uh, 49.25. And there we have now uh, a baffle in place. Coolsim is synchronous. You don't have to hit the okay button. Um, it, it'll do it for you. Um, so I just wait for it to apply. So here I need to remember the width. I couldn't remember it. So I use five. It's five feet. I should have known that. So now I use a clone. I want to offset that guy by five feet. So I want one copy, five, boom, done. All right. So now I have done my containment. Again, pretty quick, uh, at least for one, right? Now I've got a whole data center to do. Uh, so that's the first one. You see they're overlapping there. I overlapped them a little too much. That start Y on the, on the, uh, on the uh, block should have been up four inches, but uh, I didn't realize that till just now. Um, but, uh, but anyway, there it is. Now, the great thing here again is clone. So, uh, uh, and it is overlapped. I want to make sure my servers uh, stick out uh, far enough uh, so that uh, it doesn't get in the way of that of that baffle and we have issues there so now let me go back and show grills and uh, I want to replicate it now there's 
eight of these all together. So I've got the first one done. So I use a rubber band and select the whole set and I want to group it. And now I want to clone that group. And I want a total of seven because I already have one. And I want that offset to be 18 feet. Now this takes a little bit of time. I'm actually doing this in real time. I'm going to show you how this works. Um, now you see I got the count wrong, so it's telling me I got the. It's going to go out of the room. I really need seven of those, not eight. Uh, there is a little protection here. <laughs> so now I want to apply that. Now the apply takes a moment because it has to take all those objects, write them off into memory, replicate them seven times, and lay them out in this data center. Um, and I have noticed that if these object the quantity gets really large, you sometimes run out of memory because it's writing these all out into memory and replicating them. So you sometimes can't do them all at once. You have to do two or three at a time or four at a time. Depends how many objects are in the group. But it works pretty well and lays them out uh, all at once and just saves a tremendous amount of time. The other great thing about clone is that everything is perfectly lined up when you're done. You don't have to worry about alignment because the system did it for you. Now, if you remember correctly, the, there was a couple of racks missing here uh, because of that column. So I'm just going to go in there and, and delete those. Um, same thing here. So I have to first ungroup. Um, so right mouse ungroup, and then I go here and I just do a keystroke delete. And then uh, this one down here as well. Uh, so things will stay grouped unless until you ungroup them. Their groups can be nested as well, so you can have groups inside of groups. Uh, so and and the cloning all works. Everything holds up. So there now I've got uh, everything in there, and uh, I can begin to do the model. So I just wanted to show you that. I wanted to show you how to do it because uh, this is a little bit of how to in addition. And now I want to compare results. So this uh, information right here comes from output on those two models I just ran. So the question becomes, how do they differ? I ran these on medium mesh. I ran them both on medium mesh. And you see in the simple case, I was under a million cells. That means it runs fast. It only takes one core to run. And it, it, it's done in 27 minutes, pretty quick. Uh, that's a 10,000 square foot data center, by the way. That's 11.5. 11, so that's a pretty big room, but everything's lined up nicely. And uh, we get 27 minute run time. But look at our leakage. Now, the way to calculate leakage is here, 480 compared to 512. This is in the summary report, on the cool sim output. Uh, we're comparing 480 to 412, and therefore I've got about 16% uh, uh, more of uh, air than I need, okay? Uh, I'm doing it as the 412 as the base. This is sort of my base, this is the denominator of my comparison. Um, so it's compared to IT requirement in this case. Uh, over here, uh, this is a uh, leakage constraint just to the racks with my two inch gap. Now my two inch gap drove the mesh count up by a factor of uh, more than two, almost three. Remember that. When, <laughs> when you add detail, your mesh count goes up, your solve time goes up too. My solve time almost tripled as well. It did triple. So um, mesh quantity and runtime is correlated because for every one of those cells, we have to solve all the equations of, uh, you know, energy, energy conser conservation and mass and momentum and, and uh, continuity. So as a result, it takes a little longer. Now, but look what happened to the leakage. It dropped to 6%. Now remember our baffle was set at 10% here, baffle was set at 5% over here. So the percentage on the baffle really doesn't make that much difference. It's just the amount of porosity, if that's a word, the amount of porous media that we're using. How dense is your, is your screen, so to speak, with respect to leakage? But in this case, this looks pretty good to me. I, I would feel pretty good about that, 6% uh, leakage. And it's in the location that, uh, that we're interested in. So that all feels pretty good. Now, we ran this with VFD turned on, and I uh, wanted to show you some more of these outputs. At this, in this run, in both cases, I had a set point of 0.01 sensors. Uh, this is a floor pressure. Actually, it's room pressure in this case. It is compared to room average, uh, 0.01. The sensed value was 0.0088. This is just one of them. This is just crack zero. There's a set of these for every crack. I used multiple sensors. I keyed off average. You can set this any way you want, but that's how I set it in this case. It is modulating the flow. I'm running at 53.8 
right now uh, on the uh, detailed server uh, here at 60,000, but uh, on just blocks and baffles, it's not modulating uh, much at all. It's modulating less. And the reason that's true is because with just the baffle contained, we're having a lot more leakage. If we look even at temperature, this is a slice of temperature at three feet. You see um, this temperature leakage over in this section, uh, this temperature leakage a little bit on the ends uh, and on the sides, but it's fairly uniform. Um, if you take a look at the other one, this is the one with the detailed servers, uh, you see the leakage is actually a little more representative. It's happening right in between those servers. It's now, we have quite a bit of leakage here again. Uh, this is something we might want to consider. The distance between those two uh, racks is leaking because um, there's no server there to block it or to manage it and it's a baffle right there at set at 10 percent so we may want to think about that if we don't like the way that's being represented uh, we could go in and put a baffle there with zero leakage on top we could put a block in there to keep that leakage from occurring uh, but overall it's uh, it seems to be behaving pretty well I'd feel pretty comfortable with these with these sets of results uh, you could go in and tighten that up a little bit and see what it did to leakage, but in general, that's looking good. Here is the pressure. This is pressure plot again. This is baffles only, and you see that uh, the pressure looks fairly uniform, but there's not a whole lot of difference here between the pressure on the hot side and the pressure on the cold side. Remember, you want the cold side to be a little higher. So we're looking here. If we look at our plot, we're at about 0.01 here on the cold side. On the hot side here, we're a little negative, um, so we've got some, this is again compared to room average, so we're, we're below room average, which is the way you want it, but the difference there is not that high. If we take a look at the, uh, the, the model that I used with the solid containment above the racks and the leakage within the rack, again, this is at seven feet, this is a slice at seven feet, you see there's much more distinction. Uh, we, we're getting a much uh, more uniform uh, blue, which means my pressure is both lower and, uh, and more uniform compared to room. So, so this again feels pretty good. It feels like a, a little better representation than the earlier one we did. And the reason that's true is because of all the surface area above those racks and that containment. Again, surface area makes a difference. If there's too much surface area and you've got it set to 5%, you're going to get more leakage because there's just more more overall area. Here's another part of the CoolSim output. I'm only showing you uh, pieces of it here. And I wanted to show you the volumetric flow distribution for the surface, for the grills themselves, the ceiling grills. And here you see the one way over on the right is showing the maximum amount of uh, air going through that ceiling. Now the cooling units are a little tighter over here, so that shouldn't surprise us too much. Uh, but we're running up here at, uh, say, 65,000. Notice the difference between the top and the bottom is not that high. It's only uh, roughly 10%. So there's not a big difference across any of these, even though the colors do look dramatic. It's important to look at your scale. Now, if we use the other method where, we've again, we've got the blocks uh, above the rack, and we're using distinct racks in this case, um, then you notice it moves. It moves over to here. But again, the, the, the difference between these is not that great. Again, we're talking about um, three on six. So we're talking about 5% uh, variation roughly across that, that entire set. Uh, but they do move. I mean, it does make a difference on the results when you do it this way. Uh, so now uh, there's one more level of detail. There's actually two that I'm going to review, but here's one where I've done the same as before. This is the same as earlier, but here I've put distinct servers in the racks. Now, the way you do this in CoolSim is there's something called Rack Builder. So it's the same little dialog that you had before for setting up the watts per rack. But in this case, you say, I want to do individual rack specification, and a little a dialog panel pops up. And it shows you the number of views. Each one, It's like an Excel spreadsheet. We built it to look like an Excel spreadsheet. And you see that every one of these little uh, uh, slots here is a U. So what I did here is I said, well, instead of the 8KW being uniformly distributed across the entire rack, which is an assumption that may or may not be valid, uh, I'm going to assume here that the load is actually partitioned 
and, and, and focused in a couple of areas. So I've got three U's here. A little further down, I've got uh, four U's, and then I do another one down below. The sum is still eight, uh, but the individual servers are in there uh, pumping heat. This makes the velocities higher on the output and uh, is a little more realistic with respect to what's in the, in the cabinet. Now, if you're designing a brand new data center, you don't know what's going to be in the cabinet, so average watts per rack is fine. Uh, but if you're, it is an existing environment, you can do a visual inspection, walk around and just look at where they are. And actually uh, what I do is put CoolSim on a laptop and push it around on a push guard. And I actually uh, try to represent where the servers are as best I can. And then I take the wattage that is recorded for that rack and distribute it across the servers in accordance to what I feel or sense while I'm in the data center. And that's a fairly good way to do it. So let's compare that. Again, over here on the right, I have detailed racks. Um, here, the runtime, again, a little bit, uh, it's actually about the same as, as with, in other words, adding the detail didn't change the runtime all that much. Remember, this one is uh, the, the baffled one. So this is the base case. This is leakage uh, constraints, the detailed racks, and I put details in. My mesh count went up a little bit. Remember, it was under 2 million before. It was about 1.7. It went up to 2. Uh, the runtime went up a little bit, but the leakage stayed uh, just about the same. Um, the only thing I did here is uh, is improve the granularity of the heat coming out of the server themselves. Cost me a few cells. Didn't really cost too much in terms of time. The issue here is making those assumptions about where the where the load is in the racks, and uh, that can be difficult. Um, so there is. So here's one more level of detail. I wanted to show you this one as well. And uh, here, what I've done is even go to an uh, even finer degree of detail. So I think it's best at this point for me to show you how I did this. I'm going to switch over to the application itself. So here's CoolSim, and I have this model up. And I wanted to show you that you can build a cabinet. So here's a cabinet that I put together. Uh, this is as realistic as you can really possibly get. So let's just pull it apart. I, I think this is grouped. Yeah. So the great thing about CoolSim is you can build these groups and then save them off in your library or write them to, uh, to disk or write them to your memory. So here I just did an import, an import of an object, and I have some I've made in the past. If, if you want a copy of these, let me know. I can send them to you. I've got a variety of things, uh, active chimneys and passive chimneys and uh, so forth. Um, you can build these. And in this case, I built a detailed rack. So detail rack, and then you just read it in. You can also put them in memory. So there's another one I just read in. Now, if you take this apart, let me just ungroup it. You'll see what I've got here is I've got blocks on either side. So there's blocks. I've got a block on the top. And inside there, I've got baffles going across. So there's a rack. And I, in this case, I've used Rack Builder to put in some detail. So I have an IBM server in there and a, I don't know what I've got in there, storage. And I've got different uh, uh, loads associated with it. If we take a look at that rack, uh, we can see that the total load is probably still 8KW because I wanted to keep it the same. But individually, I've got uh, different uh, things going on there, like this IBM is operating at 3KW. Okay. So you can build that and put it in there. I've made the size of it small enough so that it's really the servers. I'm representing the servers. And if you look, I've got gaps on either side. So this is the, this is the gap between the server and the rack. And here's the rail leakage, okay? So I modeled the rail leakage by putting a baffle in there and setting the airflow to a certain percentage. Again, that's, uh, you know, you have to make an assumption, I assume 5%. I also put a front door on this guy because there is some impedance, although it's very low for the front door. And I also put a back door on it. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, some impedance, I made it very low. And that's the rack. So the rack consists of the servers, the two, front and back of the sides which don't leak and then the rails themselves you can build this as an object save it off to your library and then you use the clone button to create a number of them so you simply clone it and you say you know i want three of them and they're offset by i, I guess I, last time i used this it was in meters 
offset by 24 inches and and you just uh, lay them out that way and it builds it builds your rack row now uh, this is fine and the, you may like this level of detail right? it's got gaps underneath it by the way uh, but you have to remember it's it, it costs time to do that both to build it which isn't too bad but also to lay it out and then to run it running it becomes the the challenge so um, I wanted to show you that level of detail, and uh, there they are. Um, so here is that that set right here. This is CoolSim with those laid in. I did it just how I showed you. I put in a series of uh, servers. I cloned them. Now, when you get to this top and you want to lay out all these racks, uh, I was only able to do a few rows at a time before I ran out of memory on this machine, so I had to do. But still, it's not that hard to do. They're all groups. So you just go ahead and clone it two or three times. And now the results on that, let's just go back to my presentation. The results on that didn't really change things all that much. The solve time went up. Uh, let's jump to the beginning again. The solve time went up, uh, but the, uh, the results didn't change all that much. Sorry, this thing jumped back to the beginning. So there's my increased detail. Now the leakage is down around 1%, so I dropped from about 5% to 1%, and the runtime went to 105 minutes. So the runtime went up quite a bit on that um, compared to 27 minutes, so I'm over a factor of three on that. But still not too bad considering we're meshing that level of detail. So we're coming up on the hour here. I wanted to show you just one other uh, point. This is a cold aisle containment design, and I used baffles here because the surface area isn't uh, too big. That's fine. There's a small gap above and around, so there's got some leakage through the, through the, you know, representing the rails there. That's a pretty good way to do it. But if you're doing that and you have a long section that is going to be just baffle, uh, put a block in there uh, so that you don't pay the price of leakage through that section, which wouldn't be there in real world because you've got a block in place okay so something just to keep in mind and uh, just be careful I guess in summary of where the leaking occurs uh, when you're doing containment allow it to leak where is expected uh, to turn it off for the tops of the of the containment or the sides if you're really interested in predicting it tightly consider using a more detailed representation allow it to leak around let me point out that alignment is very important. If you don't align these things correctly, your mesh count's gonna get huge, your solve time's gonna go way up. Alignment's key. Using the clone tool really helps because it keeps everything aligned evenly and the mesher is happy. <laughs> what you want is a happy mesher uh, because then it uh, both will create a smaller mesh, uh, the mesh will be all lined up, and furthermore, of course, it will uh, solve quicker the mesh time is proportional the mesh size is proportional to solve time use the cool sim summary report to calculate in the results how much leakage is occurring in the model it will change based on the size of the surface area and the pressure drop across the leakage surface and uh, if you have any questions about any of this let me know i do have time for questions at this point um, i wish i had a little more time but i have time if any of you have questions, you can either try raising your hand um, uh, or you can try um, uh, uh, typing it in. If you want to try raising your hand, I can try to undo your mic, uh, but um, uh, audio could be a challenge. I'll just put it that way. Uh, otherwise, you can just type in a question and I'll try to answer it for you. So it's yours at this point to ask any questions by the way if any of you want a uh, certificate of um, professional development um, I will create those for you uh, I know that's part of your certification sequence and uh, we can uh, produce those for you on demand so I'm just going to here look for any questions we have I don't see any um, I hope you were able to see all of this uh, I hope it came across clearly. I tried running a couple of animated sequences here. Those don't always show perfectly on uh, GoToWebinar. I apologize for that if they didn't come through clearly. If you have any questions, you want to reach out to me. My email address is right there. I do have one question. It says, um, 
how can I change the color of the baffles to be transparent? Okay, that's a user question. Let me just show you that. Anything in CoolSim, let me just drag in a baffle. CoolSim has a parameter for transparency and color. Now, you have to remember to scroll down, and it's down there. Sometimes people don't remember to scroll down. I mean, this is true on crack units as well. Um, if I drag in a crack unit, um, there's also a place to scroll down, and there's some stuff down there that you might be interested in. Like down here is plenum extension <laughs> and plug fans. And so remember to scroll down. In terms of transparency, it's the fourth one right here. By the way, you can always just right mouse it and, and nearly hide, and it will take it to 50%. Okay. But there's also in the editor itself, um, if you scroll down and look for color, you see it's at 0.2 right now. You can change that if you want. You can also change the color here to whatever, uh, green. Okay, and then you can change the transparency to 0.5, and it will uh, make it um, transparent. Or you can drop it down. It was at 0.2. It was nearly, nearly visible. So you can make, make anything you like transparent. Okay. So that was uh, one of the questions that came in. Don't know if you explained before. Can you tell the delta P and axis of floor ceilings? Can you model delta pressure and axis floor and in ceilings? I think you're talking about leakage on the floor. Uh, yes, you can model leakage in the floor on CoolSim. Um, I tile leakage right here. So you can, again, put in a certain amount of leakage for the floor. For the ceiling, um, uh, I don't have a leakage parameter for the ceiling. I know ceilings do leak. So if you're doing a ceiling and you want to model the leakage, you can do it a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them is to, let's put a ceiling plenum in here, and you can drop a, a big ceiling grill in and let it leak. That's one method. So here's a big grill. And, and these are, again, just uh, leakage parameters. So you can set the leakage to be whatever you want. The other way to do it that I've done for multi-level data centers is don't use the uh, ceiling feature. Use a baffle, set the baffle for, uh, uh, whoops, for uh, uh, the X, Z axes, get it up off the floor to where you want the ceiling to be, and then set the leakage on that. So yeah, you can do it. Um, there is a way to do that. So I'm afraid that's all I have time for. Today, uh, I'd like to thank you for attending, and uh, just reach out to me if you have any other any other questions. Thank you.